Hello. Off to Zach, how are you? I'm great. Good uh, Welcome to the first uh, video edition of the Tokenomics Podcast. Glad to be here. Thank you very much. Yeah. Quite so, excited. So as opposed to butcher uh, an introduction, uh, how about tell me a little bit about your background and what you're working on at Ping Me. Yeah, so uh, I'm Brendan Playford, co-founder of Ping Me. Um, other co-founder is my partner, Kate. We've been working on Ping Me now for just over a year. Um, started building in stealth and gradually have kind of bought the technology out and started testing. Uh, and what Ping Me is, it's our vision for democratizing the way in which businesses access credit and finance. So um, we're building a two-sided lending marketplace that allows lenders and borrowers to connect between uh, developed economies where lending rates are very low, or borrow, sorry, yeah, lending rates are very low, um, and emerging markets where the uh, cost of acquiring credit is very high. So bringing these two markets together using blockchain technology means that people, for example, from the US uh, can get better yield on their cash assets, and people in emerging markets can get a lower cost of credit, which is otherwise very expensive. So could you explain a little bit about uh, how you're using blockchain uh, and why that's necessary for the core function of your business? Yeah, so um, part of our kind of vision is that we've seen over the last 10 years a lot of instances where rate setting in markets uh, is generally done by a lot of like individual verticalized industries. So in 2012, we had the LIBOR scandal where uh, LIBOR has been fixed for a long period of time. And, and what's LIBOR for our listeners? So it's the uh, London interbank uh, kind of lending rate. It's the rate at which banks can lend between each other. Um, and that was set by a small group of banks for a very long time. Deutsche Bank, uh, Credit Suisse, there's a whole host of banks that are involved in that. And generally what we see in the markets right now is if you've got great credit, you can go and acquire capital for very low rates below the kind of Fed, around the Fed interest rates for like the 1.5, 2%. But if you're somewhat new to the market or a small business, you're paying really high rates and actually accessing growth finance for your business is, is quite challenging. So there's a big gap in the middle of rates between 5 to sort of 20% that currently are served by banks. Uh, and you end up getting verticalized by your sort of risk. So when you look at somebody in, uh, let's say, Kenya, for example, they might be able to go and get like bank financing from a microfinance institution, we call those MFIs, or go to a smaller local regional bank. And those rates can range from anywhere between 30 to 200%. Uh, and that is because right now there's not much competition in the market and uh, those rates are being set by individuals that really only give one point of access to this kind of uh, yeah. sort of facility. Um, and in addition, you know, the access to credit is limited because traditional scoring mechanisms through centralized credit rating agencies is pretty limited. You still get credit agencies in, in many countries, but when you start getting into uh, emerging markets where the growth overall is really kind of, uh, uh, there's a lot of growth right now financially, smaller companies can't get this traditional credit. So we do digital credit scoring to allow companies coming to our marketplace at a known risk. So for um, the, the companies and individuals that are looking for loans and right now having to pay 30 to 200% to these MFIs, uh, what's actually the risk on these loans? Like I'm sure there's a lot of empirical data about the repayment rates and just off, you know, I happen to know a bit about your business being an investor, but even when I first kind of heard this, my initial thought was, wow, the cost of capital is absurdly high and there's a complete uh, you know, a, a disconnect between what the real risk is and what's being priced in. Yeah, that's a really good point. And I, I will get back to your original question, which was how does blockchain fit into this? So I'll yeah. answer this question and kind of underpin it or we'll come back to that. Um, so just ask the question again. So um, it seems to me that there's like a humongous spread between what the yeah. real like risk um is and what's it is being priced at yeah uh so i can you know see the cost of capital being necessarily higher for you know small companies in emerging markets without uh like a formalized credit score yeah compared to like a small business in the u.s yeah uh but being you know orders of magnitude higher it seems like the risk is probably not orders of magnitude higher Correct. and there's a big inefficiency in this market yeah. Yeah. so it's a combination you've hit the nail on the head with the with the inefficiency and Really, I think where we see blockchain playing a critical role for us is the way in which you match these two sides of the marketplace in a decentralized way. Yeah. So we just kind of refer to the fact that rates have been set 
in a centralized manner by few individuals. Uh, our vision is to democratize that down so as the marketplace dictates what those rates should be based on known risk. So we may not be bringing a lot of borrowers to the market that are um, necessarily have low credit. We may be picking a group of borrowers that are MFI, sort of a B2B play to start with, yeah. that run their own risk management and currently suffer from high borrowing rates on USD kind of uh, like collateral, like capital. And the reason is because they have to source their capital overseas. They generally can't source it in country. Yeah. Um, so that actually makes the cost of capital to MFI is very expensive. Um, with a blockchain architecture, allowing the market to sort of find an equilibrium without a central party effectively raises the yield for people looking to actually put money to work um, and then lowers that cost of capital for people that do have a lower risk. Um, so diving into like where does that risk get mitigated, we have and we can, we can go deeper into this, a variety yeah. of techniques, but you're absolutely right. Companies right now are penalized for having early credit, a lack of credit, even if they do have assets that they can collateralize loans with in these markets because there's not very much competition. And there's sheer geography, penalized for geography. Sheer yeah. geography and, and, and competition. You know, you have a couple of new, I would say, neo lenders, um, Taller and Branch, uh, and they have verticalized themselves into this digital credit scoring model where it's unsecured loans. The default rates for those guys is about 8 to 9%, which is disproportionate to the actual rate of interest they charge across the market. So they're still charging annualized anywhere between 30 to 200%. Uh, these figures are pretty public. They're on their website. You can yeah. check them out. Um, and that doesn't account for the actual current default rate. And you can look at... They're the highest risk borrowers. They're people that haven't had credit before. This is a new credit model that hasn't been tested through a downturn. Um, and what they are doing is uh, providing short-term loans uh, to individuals that don't secure it. So the highest risk loans right now have a default rate of between 7 and 10%. And that's covered by extraordinary high APRs. Yeah. A little bit above that, you have MSMEs, which is what we're targeting. And these are generally businesses that are making profit, have assets, we can secure the loans on the borrower side with their assets. Yeah. Um, whether that be equity assets, whether that be fixed assets like plant and machinery. Um, and then all the way on the top end of our marketplace, you can view it almost like a risk stack. Yeah. Uh, we have NFIs and mobile money uh, providers. Uh, and they, those individuals actually hold the risk of default in the marketplace. So they manage their own risk profiles. They take a larger chunk of capital, let's say a million dollars, and they will lend that out to a thousand people and they manage the risk. But we're able to save their money on the cost of capital. So long term, you're going to be going direct to SMEs and direct to consumers. Correct. But to start to kind of mitigate your risk and go to market yep. more quickly, you're going to be just lowering the cost of capital for the MFIs. Correct. So there'll be like one kind of intermediary to start, yep. but the the rate is still going to be set um, in an algorithmic function to start, or is that... Yeah, and we have, we have two methods of doing this yeah. that we're looking at. Um, so that's a really good question. Ultimately, what we'd like to get to is this notion of a decentralized order book of loans, yeah. of which all participants in that market basically determine the rate on a certain day. And does anything like that exist right now? No, there's nothing like that. The, 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 yeah. bigger, the nearest analogy you can think to this is that the way that Bitfinex runs their margin funding facility and um, collateralizing against uh, margin oh, positions. Yeah. And they have like a lending and borrowing marketplace. You could think of it analogous to that, adding a risk variable into, into the, uh, the way the marketplace works. And um, you're absolutely right. So going to market for a company like us is it's extremely critical to manage risk on the borrower side minimize that build trust in the platform and get liquidity in the platform uh, having actual capital flowing is, is vitally important so our first target is the good mfis that have got solid traction and long-standing mobile money providers we have an early partnership with a mobile money network in Nigeria. Mm -hmm. um, they've been going 14 years. They have around 3 million customers and 9,000 agents. And an agent is effectively like their bank branch run by a human. Um, and 
we we working with though with these kind of companies to like you said lower that cost of capital and at the minute the cost of capital for an MFI or a mobile money provider can be anywhere between fifteen to thirty percent, and they want to be looking at you know ten percent uh, price or lower yeah. to be really competitive and able to pass that on to their actual um, customer. So uh, that is something that we're, we're going to be catering. And you feel like. Um, you know, you can offer a rate like this and still have a large margin of safety in terms of uh, the risk you're taking on uh, lending to the MFIs. Yeah, absolutely. And, and what, what I want to be clear on is like we're providing this, this platform and going back to the question of like rate setting with algorithms, it may well be that in our first iteration, it's done using some kind of auction process. So when we have a small number of high volume MFIs. The reverse Dutch uh, auction. Yeah. With Vitalik's uh, favored. Yeah, exactly. Method. Yeah. So you can have multiple participants coming into uh, a particular offer uh, and you can ascertain the best rate of interest. Yeah. And we're looking at like Vickery Clark Groves as well for doing some of this. There's some... And then you're not penalized for being truthful. Exactly. Like auctions. Yeah. Exactly. Cool. And, and that we think is like a really good way initially of in limited participants optimizing the best rate of interest based on demand. Cool. Uh, so I think that's a really nice thorough uh, kind of summary of like what you're working on, how you're going to market. But this is the tokenomics podcast. Um, so why do you have your own token and why is that you know part of your go to market strategy? Yeah, so um, the token functions in, in three ways. First and foremost, you know, this vision of having a decentralized network that allows this rate setting functionality to happen uh, with all incentives aligned for all participants. So in order to launch a network like that, we need to have validators and uh, nodes on the network that provide truthful outcomes and report that. So the token serves as an incentive mechanism in the way that proof of stake works. We'll be onboarding uh, validators onto the network as we build it out. Uh, and those, those validators will, in the way that a proof of stake network uh, gets rewarded for providing the validation and enforcement of that and also governance as well. So there'll be an election process within those validators to bring more in and over the course of three or four years will gradually uh, increase uh, the number of nodes on the network, starting off around 10 to start with and trying to get more and more progressively decentralized. A little bit of the way that EOS block producers started off but not capping that 21 going beyond that so as there's a way you can vote more people in to make it more inclusive. Um, secondarily, we use it for incentives. So ultimately, we want to have a marketplace where we have retail borrowers and retail lenders as well as institutional. That's the ultimate goal. Uh, and we offer a point system where people who sign up to the mobile application or platform get rewarded for certain behaviours. So we use it as a very clear incentive mechanism that drives adoption on the network. Um, and that adoption comes from generally the B2C customer. Um, and we have been running tests on this and we have people are able to kind of like, we'll be yeah. able to download the app and then earn tokens um, for staking those and using the actual app. So um, when I first invested in this business uh, and first started seeing things, uh, it was much more of a B2C play to start. Yeah. And like a lot of early stage companies, uh, it becomes, you know, to B to B and B to C, and then yeah. to kind of B to B for obvious reasons. Uh, how does the token still play as much of an integral role at the, on the outset? Now that you're going kind of direct to the to the MFIs. Yeah, so so I really think it does. Um, for our actual, you you know, our value proposition for the network is building on the core of this lending engine. However, we spent a lot of time building our own uh, mobile wallet, which has a lot of the functionality of Ethereum abstracted, so gas fees are abstracted, um, and you pay your fees in the token you're transferring in the wallet. Yeah. Um, we've used uh, some of the bread implementation, the open source bread wallet, to mm -hmm. provide this architecture, and our own side chain to Ethereum, um, which then updates its state. You can think of it a little bit the way that IDEX provides decentralized exchange in a mobile app that's for peer-to-peer -peer payments. So how does this come into play for the yeah, direct so, lending to MFIs? So, so we see that having a core base of organic B2C mm -hmm. for um, the actual app itself, being able to have people transacting and 
using the payments and, and other functionality is really important because when you look at an MFI, um, they have about 62% of their cost built in the disbursement and the administration of the actual loan. Oh, so when you're working with the MFIs, they're using the Ping Me wallets, they're using your architecture. And that is our goal. So like I see, goal okay. is then with these MFIs over the next year or so is that we partner and we have one initial partner uh, in Seattle doing this where they will take a white label version of our application yeah. and they'll actually deploy that into market. So for them being able to have their users use our app and have the same incentive mechanism actually benefits their business and helps them reduce that cost. So then if, and if other lenders want to use the data to yeah. set their own rates, yeah. they have the benefit of that as well. So exactly. like you have the, yeah, a lender that's based yeah. out of Seattle, they're now right. running all things on their own white label, yeah. but that information can be shared to set rates broadly speaking for your B2C customers and your other exactly. B2B clients. Yeah. And we do see there's value in this peer to peer payment app where people can transact at very low fees without the complexity of Ethereum. And that's something we built. We started B2C, we built that. We're now pivoting more to our go-to-market for B2B, but we still see there's inherent value in that. So yeah. building a community around that, like a strong community for us, like long-term is you know, a three to five year thing. And we can start that now. And that can be like our grassroots community that builds around the token. Yeah. Cool. Yeah, no worries. So uh, you kind of answered this in, in you know, the, the answer to the last question, but, you know, why is it necessary to do this via, uh, you know, token secured by a distributed network versus a loyalty point or something? Because to start, there's going to be some degree of trust for ping me as a company. Yeah. Um, so can you just kind of really uh, hammer on why like a blockchain secured token is necessary and not just yeah. kind of some other marker for this uh, more decentralized rate setting? So, when you look at having multi-parties in an ecosystem, which we have, we have stakeholders ranging from validators to BTC users um, to various apps that are also going to be using our architecture. When there is more of a distributed interest mm -hmm. from multiple parties and we feel that there is not a good uh, outcome when one organization has sort of a monopoly over that infrastructure, the logical sort of philosophical route for us is to make sure that we're using a decentralized architecture, not a centralized one from the word go. Um, the way that we look at the technology now is that generally speaking on a base layer, when you're looking at side chains or um, instances of like our Ethereum kind of base layer that we use, yeah, the cost to deploy that is around the same cost as a uh, centralized database. It's just the tooling around it that becomes a little bit more bespoke and a bit more specialized. So for us, we have multiple parties on a network and we have a rate that's being set for the benefit of the participants. We don't view that that should be coming directly from us. We think that should be more of an ownerless structure. But yes, I understand that. But yeah. why is blockchain necessary for that versus just an ownerless? Uh, well, um, more specifically, why couldn't the 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 borrowers not the mfis but the, the end borrowers uh -huh. um use some type of still white label ping me wallet and you know full stack uh but instead of receiving a token that's secured on oh, the ethereum exactly. side chain yeah uh you know from a centralized database yeah so a lot of this is the way in which you can kind of look at compliance so we've been really careful to in the mobile app maintain custody of the assets in the user's device so when you create a an account and a wallet through PingMe, yeah. you as the user have custody of private keys. If we were to do a verticalized stack where it was a normal kind of custodial solution through a bank, we wouldn't have the flexibility of being able to serve so many markets and be able to go truly peer to peer. So yeah. it gives the user full ownership of their assets. That is not possible in a centralized system. Yeah. Yeah. And then in, in each of the markets we go into, there's different regulations. So for us, with this vision of being more global and peer-to-peer, -peer, that really is only possible by having a, a non-custodial non blockchain solution. Okay. Yeah, that's, sorry, I get what you're getting at there. Yeah, um, cool. Um, so what made you decide to build as like an ERC-20 on an Ethereum sidechain yeah. versus kind of all your other options? Yeah, so having, having you know, looked at building things like DAGs in the past, 
Um, <laughs> you know, the way that IOT has gone, just the general proliferation of lots of new networks. Yeah. Um, there's still a first mover advantage of the theorem in terms of how, you know, there's obviously a lot of like conjecture and annoyance about ETH 2.0 and whether or not that's really going to happen. When you look at the kind of services that are deployed on Ethereum right now, for example, USDC, um, so that's the US backed sta USD backed stablecoin issued by Circle, which we are going to be supporting, that has about half a billion in um, actual liquidity in its treasury. There are no other stable coins on any other network that come close to that. So there is a lot of product forward decisions in terms of we're going to an end user and an actual business use case. We want to be using infrastructure that so far to this point has been built to serve and integrate. Like Circle has great on and off ramps within the US. We have a banking partner that can provide custody of those assets. An institution can come on, go through compliance, AML, KYC, on board to Circle and then easily acquire Circle. So and those on ramps with that level of ease is just not possible off, off Ethereum right, right now. now. Yeah. yeah. So does it does ETH 2.0 worry you? Um, for the you know long-term future of the uh, yeah, token? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, I think for us, you know, the way in which it's looking at being graduated is that you still have grandfathering into the ETH 1.0 as we're going through sort of beacon into like the sharded kind of ecosystem. The way it stands at the moment, it's so far off that the infrastructure we're building yeah. will get a lot of value out of it first, contributing that back. And what I hope is that as the ecosystem evolves, we can either contribute back or we'll find another alternative that's established yeah. itself, to be honest with you. Well, I definitely agree it's far off. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. yeah. So, so as I've kind of made clear to you in, you know, um, like conversations off, you know, off the air. Yeah. Um, I'm personally very skeptical of a lot of, you know, or basically all kind of proof of stake networks, especially yeah. those that are trying to have like a, be like, incredibly decentralized uh you know including eth 2.0 yeah um so definitely one of like you know frankly my concerns around uh you know the ping token uh is kind of the you know the governance and how so much of like governance for for ping and in like distributed networks in general is you know really really untested and the kind of proof of stake like methods there's i think in inarguably like a security trade-off uh, compared to yeah. proof of work yeah. and want to know like kind of what your thinking is on proof of stake and what made you kind of, you know, decide to go, go that direction. Yeah. So as a, as a long-term miner, I'm very, <laughs> I, I love proof of work. Like, yeah. right? I think, I think it has a lot of value both for culturing and fostering a community that gets around an asset and, it, and even a network. When you look at some, so here my kind of, favorite networks outside of this like if you look at something like decred which is a bitcoin fork they're, they're really experimenting with new governance that's community based and that becomes very interesting that is a proof of stake proof of work hybrid um which is interesting in which the way the participants can become a little bit more democratic including voting on issues so that is still highly experimental i think that when we're in a phase of with governance it is all experimental and we haven't yet figured out what truly works. So at the moment, you've got a couple of choices. You choose security and distribution with proof of work at the sacrifice of maybe speed, or you take speed and efficiency and being a little bit more towards an enterprise environment where you can serve more customers, but you end up being a little bit more centralized. There's, there's generally a trade-off for each. So what we're trying to do is take a pragmatic view where at the minute we are not being too ambitious in our goal and letting some other people, like if you look at Decred, Radix as well, Radix is yeah. building a new kind of um, DLT specifically for payments, really interesting consensus algorithm, crazy speeds, really interesting throughput, going to have a, a whole host of different languages you can build on. I'm really excited for seeing where Radix comes. It's been seven years in development already and it's yeah. still not production grade and they're doing amazing work, but we need to be cognizant that some of this technology takes a while. So we want to capture some of this market now. And for us doing a proof of stake and getting stakeholders that we feel like can add value to the network initially is really important. Yeah. 
and that is a little bit more, I think, easy for us to do with with an initial proof of stake model. Yeah, and 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 you're making a, a clear trade off, kind of for like a proof of work level of security and immutability, which is you know, yeah. in my understanding, rival to none. Yeah. Uh, for something that is still you know, but meaningfully better than the way these types of decisions are made uh, for existing exactly. products out there. Yeah. And it, um, yeah. yeah. If if let's say there was a you know highly scalable proof of work blockchain that continues to kind of, you know, grow in terms of like maximum possible yeah. uh, practical block size. How would that potentially change your 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 thinking on governance uh, and on the token long term? So I think ultimately, you know, we would like the underlying network to be owned by the network and for that decision to come from the community. So ultimately we want to get this thing launched yeah. and uh, as a company build on this framework. Like we, we're building a company, we have a revenue model, we have a business model that's going to drive uh, profits for Ping Me, the company. But underneath this, there is this uh, network layer which we view as providing an infrastructure for this sort of new financial technology to be built on, of which Ping Me is the first thing on it. And I would like to think that we can work with the community to move towards a good option. And if there is a better option, we should seriously consider that as it comes up in the future 100%. Um, I don't have any kind of adver aversion to that. I would say that we are focused on building the most functioning base layer right now because it can get extremely costly building these new networks. Definitely. Yeah, yeah. Which, is, which is sort of somewhat intimidating. I think there's a lot of people that are quite ambitious and the resources and the develop a talent you need to deploy on these networks is quite high. And that's what's so difficult, like yeah. as an investor looking at, you know, both crypto assets, networks and companies, yeah. which is a lot of times you have like the normal, incredibly high startup risk of starting a company, building a new product, getting yeah. users, and then, you know, you know, multiplying that by building a completely new governance distributed ledger exactly. system. And yeah, it starts to, even if the ambitions are, are very high, it, you know, not necessarily something attractive to get, to get funded. Um, yeah. And it's, it's also, uh, you know, your engineering resources are, are quite challenging. The, the, when you start looking at really technical distributed networks and like novel consensus algorithms, there is a small set of individuals that can code that. And when you go and try and source people, that's an extremely competitive environment. Not only have you got the likes of Google, Uber, Salesforce, getting these people to do like deep learning, distributed computing, uh, you know, systems, which all of these companies have on their back end. Like, yeah. there is also big applications of this kind of technology in a centralized setting. That's an extremely competitive marketplace without trying to attract those people into the kind of blockchain market. It's, and, it's a real challenge. And you really, and as a result, you get the ideologically motivated. Yep, uh, exactly. Because they, of course, can't compete with, yeah. you know, the, the cash yeah. of these large <laughs> companies. Yeah. Um, so talk to me a little bit about, you know, kind of your vision for governance, uh, you know, for, for the ping token and what that looks like to start and how that will grow. And especially with a, with a focus on how you might be doing things differently than, you know, other networks that have come before. Yeah. That's a really good question. So I'm a big believer in the kind of mining incremental distribution of tokens. We've, uh, seen in the past, in 2013, everything was mined from ground zero. We then went to like a 2014-15 pre-mined scenario where tokens are pre-mined by developers or all coins are pre-mined by developers. And were there then, that many altcoins in 14-15? Yeah, there was a lot. Oh, there was okay. continuous launches, you know, anything from a Myriad coin, which is in the top like 500 somewhere right the way through to... This is before Ethereum? Uh, yeah. 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 Um, via coin there's there's a lot there's a big graveyard <laughs> yeah. and a big list on coin market cap that has these ones so there was a generally a fork of some description with a different either x11 or you know variant of, of blake different novel algorithm on top of one of these tokens like being launched every day um through bitcoin talk and you can look through the archives and see how many uh anons or announcements that there were um and you know, our model is such that we've tried to lay out a very limited initial distribution where as people join 
the app or the network, we mint tokens into existence. So we have a very small distribution for the treasury of the uh, of the of the issuer, um, and then some core advisors and people that come in to like help get everything set up. But we're not doing a public sale. Uh, we're doing an initial distribution coming up very soon, and ultimately we have from the word go a set allocation of where tokens are going that is going to be into like proof of stake distribution and all the way we're not going to have it where just one group of individuals can stake and earn tokens that's not just the validators anybody that stakes tokens on the network right the way through, from something that has 10 tokens right the way through to a hundred thousand for example will get the same rate of reward um, as anyone on the network. So in terms of the governance initially, we've set a very, what we think is transparent token model with fixed inflation that reduces over a period of time. Um, and our goal ultimately is to introduce the right amount of liquidity sequentially with the growth of the network and the growth of users on the platform. Um, and as we evolve the network, if there's any changes to be made to that model, we should invoke the voice of the community and those kind of yeah. decisions. And that is very similar to the way that Decred does. Decred have a voting and a ticketing mechanism where they have issues come up and uh, you have to stake or submit a certain number of votes. Um, and that is something that, you know, we'd like to define more than what we have right now. But yeah. at the minute we're starting off with an initial fixed supply distribution schedule that everybody can understand and uh, plan for. And that's driven by growth. It's not driven by a sale, for example. Yeah. So, I, yeah. Um, I'm so not going to answer the question about like specific. Well, governance. so things are very clear on the distribution side of things, yeah. but really more on like the the governance of how future decisions will be made on the network. Uh, Understood. You know, it, it's it's going to look like to start, um, you know, in the realm of uh, like distributed proof of uh, proof of stake. Yeah. Um, and similar to EOS yeah. in that regard. Could you yeah. talk a little bit about like just specifically what it will look like and you know maybe how it differs from EOS and the other kind of DPOS yeah. networks out yeah. there? Yeah. So um, the way delegated proof of stake. Yeah. Anyway, yeah. That's, that's, yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that's all good. Um, so that's a good point. So like in, in mining, if you have like a software upgrade, you have to do a hard fork or if you know there is a disagreement in the network, you'll end up with a, a hard fork like to give rise to Bitcoin, BCH, BSV, for example. So that is a difference in sort of the community wanting a different way for the network to go and they choose by hash power and you get a fork. So that's the way the proof of work, work works. Our, our network won't really exist like that. We'll have initially a group of validators much more like, unfortunately, the EOS model. And I say unfortunately because that is um, one where, you know, there are different views around whether or not that's a good thing for the else network we want to go a little bit further than that and allow validators to be voted in and uh, acquire a position in the network yeah to govern it sort of to govern that from the staking position um we see that as an incremental increase to proof of stake and, th and there's a couple of things that you have to be careful of here one is the number of tokens that are required to stake on the network. So we're running an auction process behind determining what the adequate amount of tokens are to become a validator. Mm -hmm. So again, the network isn't going to set the required number of tokens to become a validator. Uh, the number of participants sort of bidding for validator spots will determine the required state beyond a certain point. In a reverse Dutch fashion? We've modeled this on a Vickery Clark Okay. Roads mechanism, which is in our. Um, Could you maybe explain Vickery Clark? Yeah. yeah. So it's it's somewhat of a new way, and you'll have a group of people that say it has its problems. You have a group of people like me that say it's like an elegant way of creating a dominant strategy for, you know, selling an asset or setting a price on an asset. Um, and basically, what you do is you take uh, a summation over all of the bids for an item or two items. Um, so if you're selling two of something and you have three bidders, one bidder might bid an amount to buy both of those items. Let's say they bid $5,000 for each item, a grand total of 10,000. And then the two other par parties in the auction uh, bid 6,000 each 
sorry, no, let's say one bid's 8,000, the other bid's 4,000. That aggregate total is 12,000, and it'll actually get split, so each party pays six and six, and that's optimizing the amount of capital yielded for selling those assets and the price paid for each one between the two parties. What if the person that bid 4,000 can't or doesn't want to pay 6,000? Uh, that's a matter of like checking to see whether they actually have like the capital to pay that in an auction. Yeah, that's that could be a barrier. Um, but generally speaking, in these in these auctions, in order for the second party to follow through with the actual sale, they have to complete on that price. And then if they don't like, is this something that's checked upon the time of bidding, so it's known like the assets in the wallet? Yeah. So or does it assume this, and then if it doesn't work, it reoptimizes. So for us, you would need to. There would we we would have to implement, or we are we will need to implement a way in which to have that almost guarantee. But this is used in things like auctions for uh, like Olympic cities, for example. So in the yeah, way in which it does in in real in real situations, you have uh, when you're buying a house, you have a certain amount that you have kind of escrowed, yeah, and you can bid within that range. So it'd be the same thing. You have like a certain maximum bid, and you you bid within a range underneath that. So yeah, my, my thought was just that like, given you're going to be bidding, presumably using crypto assets, yeah. uh, you have the ability uh, to then like connect something to a wallet uh, exactly. such that you can see the total capital that that person has. Yeah. Um, and you know, there perhaps be some types of terms, the auction stuff that like anything you put in the wallet or just in which you bid, you're comfortable doing and then there could be optimizations from that and yeah there's yeah. There's, there's going to be an escrow element where in order to participate you have to escrow assets and then you bid within the bounds of that escrow um so you can't do you even need to if if, if you're able to check the wallet do you, do you need to be able to escrow uh yes okay in, in this environment yeah you would you would uh escrow in a multi-sig wallet where each party at the end of the auction then completes to to finalize the sale because obviously the third bidder who loses gets the assets back uh, and they will have to sort of agree that the sale is completed in some way. Okay, so my, my last question here is, could you briefly summarize the differences between this and a reverse Dutch auction? Yeah, so uh, reverse Dutch auction um, in this case is where you have uh, a number of parties bidding at varying rates. So uh, for example, if we had a certain quantity of something, a known quantity of a good, uh, let's say we had, I'm going to use a loan as, a, as an example, let's say there was a, a bid out for a $100,000 loan and you had three parties wanting to buy that loan at a certain interest rate. So for $100,000, the person looking to take that loan isn't setting the interest rate. You have buyers coming in that are going to fill that loan. Uh, let's say there's three participants and uh, the first two participants put in bids of 6% uh, interest in the, the first one, the second one puts in a 7% uh, interest, and both of those bids are for $40,000 uh, each. Okay. That means that we filled up $80,000 of that demand. We then have a third bidder come in and they want to buy another like 40,000, but there's only 20,000 left and they're bidding at like 8%. So we actually take the second highest rate mm -hmm. in the auction, so not the 8%, the 7% rate, to determine the rate of this loan. And each participant at the bottom contributes 40 and 40, and then the person on the top contributes 20 of that 100,000 allocation. So it optimizes for the second highest sort of bid, and in this case it's interest, okay. until the full thing is set. And if those sold. bids were made in a reverse Dutch auction, how would that differ? So that is a reverse Dutch auction. Oh. Yeah. So sorry, if, if that yeah. if that was made in a Vickery Plants yeah. Grove. Um, it'd be slightly different because you would there's various mechanisms for doing different sales. This we're talking about setting an interest rate for a single item. In the previous example we gave using Vickery Clark's Grove, you might have one or more items, in which case you're trying to sell all of those items for the best price for all items. And we use that when we're selling, let's say, for example, multiple uh, validator nodes. So Vickery Clark really only makes sense when you're selling multiple of the same yes, item. Yes, exactly. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Or reverse Dutch is, is on a single. Yeah, that's okay. right. Yeah. Cool. And you can still do it on like a, you know, if you look at the ETH auction, for example, there was X number of Ethereum tokens sold and 
instead of the rate of to, uh, the rate of interest in that example, it was a price that people were bidding. So the, pr the, the price filled up from the bottom, and then once all tokens were sold, it took the price below the highest yeah. to set the overall rate. Um, so that's where there's a single auction, but multiple items all priced the same. As a and you can do that again with, uh, you could do that again with validator nodes as well. If you have twenty different nodes you're trying to auction, each person would put a bid in. So they're pretty similar. They are. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. I I know you you you've mentioned the Victory Clark auction before. Um, yeah. But I thanks I'm, for thanks for explaining it. <laughs> so it, it's I. We well, should almost, content on almost it. all clear now. Yeah. yeah. Sure. Yeah. Nice. This is fun. Yeah. Well, uh, Brennan, I know you got a lot of stuff on your plate. Yeah. Um, I don't want to take too much of your time today, but thanks so much for uh, coming on the Tokenomics Podcast. Yes. Thanks for having me today. Really yeah. appreciate it.